You're watching the Luca Rosano Show. Here's your host, Luca Rosano. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm now here with J.E. Skeets, co-host of the No Dunks podcast on The Athletic, formerly on The Starters on NBA TV, and OGs would know this, the Basketball Jones on the score. That's actually when I first started watching you. Thanks so much for being on the show. How you doing, man? No problem. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being a, a longtime fan. Uh, if you're watching or listening in the Basketball Jones days, that's... Uh... That's about a decade ago now. So. I'm trying not to have a fanboy moment, but this is really cool to do. I really appreciate you right. taking the time. I mean, I get to talk basketball with a guy I grew up watching. Not to make you seem old or anything, but... Uh... <laughs> oh, I'm old. No, it's official. I'm old. I'm turning 40 later this summer, so we're hitting uh, midlife crisis time. Here. You don't look a day older than 25, I must say. So whatever you're doing, oh, appreciate it. keep doing it. Um, All right, good. So, so Skeets, let's, let's talk about, obviously, the NBA trade deadline. Took place yesterday. Of course, some big moves that happened. Andrew Wiggins getting a fresh start with the Warriors. D'Lo going to Minnesota. He's going to be playing alongside his good buddy and Carl Anthony Towns. Then we saw a bit of a head scratcher, in my opinion, with Drummond getting traded to the Cavs. No love was involved in that. Or Tristan Thompson. I want to get your winners and losers of the NBA trade deadline. So why don't we start with your uh, losers? My losers, yeah. I, it's tough not to pick... Um, the Detroit Pistons getting what they got back for Andre Drummond. Um, I also understand maybe why they did it because they just wanted to rip off the bandaid and lean into the rebuild and maybe got a little worried that, Oh my God, is Andre Drummond actually going to pick up that final year of his option and go into that 28 million? And do we want him for another year? So let's just get off it. But to only get back John Henson, Brandon Knight and the lesser of the second round pick, that's it for a guy that, is a two-time all-star, is an elite, obviously, rebounder. You know, 17 15, the defense is there. He's okay. He's become a better playmaker. He's gotten even better at the line. To only get that package back just to get off of him and even the worry of having to pay him or have to pay him another year, um, that's rough. I mean, it, it feels to me if they were going to make this decision, they could have got more for him yeah. a year ago or, or earlier, obviously. So, th so that's pretty tough. Um, that just uh, honestly a loser for the Pistons in a weird way, but a loser for Andre Drummond, who like that's what you get back. That's that's gotta hurt. I mean, even looking at his career, you thought you were in a bad position with Detroit, then you go to Cleveland. I mean, talk about getting worse in a heartbeat. <laughs> yeah, I mean that. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You, the agent calls you and says basically, "What? I have good news and I have bad news, and the good news is you've been traded, but the bad news is you're going to Cleveland." It's like uh, great. So I'm just in the same position. Now what? So yeah, it's tough not to pick uh, Yeah, Drummond and the Pistons there. Uh, Skeets, I want to get your quick thoughts on the Lakers because a lot of people are calling them losers for the fact that they weren't able to get anything done. And uh, you saw what the Clippers were able to do, bringing in Morris and Isaiah Thomas, uh, bolstering their roster. Do you think the yep. Lakers have something in store, i.e. getting a J.R. Smith or Collison who was at the game last night? Or uh, would you classify them as a losers for not doing anything or, or not? No, I think that's going a little too far. I get that the Clippers, uh, you know, they won the Marcus Morris arms race, as we were calling it. And, and again, let's not go crazy. It is Marcus Morris. He's good. He's a fine player. He's putting up 20 points on the on the god-awful Knicks, so let's not go overboard. But, yeah, the Lakers are going to hopefully try and get, like, Darren Collison, like you said, being at the game, uh, being a playmaker that they could use. Maybe a shooter. Is it J.R. Smith? Is it another guy that – is possibly in the buyout market. Does Wayne Ellington find his way to that market? Who knows? Um, but yeah, going to a, to say they were a loser because what? They didn't trade Kyle Kuzma to get Marcus Morris? I mean, I think I would not have done that, and I'm not even the biggest Kyle Kuzma fan, but even that feels like a bit of a stretch to me. So loser's too far, but I understand where people are coming from. The idea, like, they didn't do a whole lot, and the team that they're going to be challenging in the Western Conference, the Clippers— they bolstered their depth or their bench or even maybe even starting Morris a little bit more. But I think the Lakers will be fine still sort of with what they have. They didn't, they didn't freak out and, uh, you know, give away too much to get Marcus Morris, possibly on a three, four-month rental. Let's move now to uh, your winners or winner of the NBA trade deadline. Who would, uh, who would that be? I think there's, there's lots to pick from. I actually, when we did our trade deadline grades on the No Dunks podcast, I found us giving a lot of decent marks, grades to a lot of the teams uh, involved, like be it the Grizzlies getting something for Iguodala, um, Injustice Winslow, who fits their timeline, and if he can stay healthy, is a really good player and makes sense in that roster. Yeah. The Heat, the heat for getting Iguodala and then helping their books 
and not having to give up any of their rotation guys. I mean, they gave up guys that they had suspended and waiters and James Johnson and then Justice Winslow, who never even played. So he wasn't part of the rotation because they had, you know, Duncan Robinson and they've got their rookies and Hero and Nunn and they've got, they've got a lot of talent there. So that was a plus for them. But I'm actually going to go with the Minnesota Timberwolves as my winner. Like, look, things got bad. Uh, Towns hasn't won a game since before Thanksgiving. Yeah, it's been, it's a, been long a while. Time. They needed to do something, and they got off of Wiggins' contract. He was never on. He was just never gonna, you know, live up to expectations at this point in Minnesota. See, he needed a fresh start. They needed to move on from him, and what they got in return was D'Angelo Russell, who. If we're looking at all the guys traded over the last 48 hours or so, I mean, he's one of the best. Yeah. I mean, he, he was an all-star. He's obviously a scorer. He has limitations defensively. But the Wolves, I called it basically like a life preserver because that franchise and Towns and the front office, the fans, they needed something. They needed like some some little hope. And maybe this idea of Russell pairing with Towns, being buddies, being obviously offensive, uh, offensive um, you know, power, the two of them, a weapon – that's that's a little spark, a little something to get excited about because it wasn't going to be with Wiggins. So I think I go the Wolves getting Russell and getting off Wiggins and seeing where they go from here. They're not going to make the playoffs this year, but you know it costs them a, a high pick. It could be, but they think they're going to be better than maybe what the Warriors think they're going to be in yeah. sort of a you know a five or six pick or something like that. So I got to go with the Wolves. They got they got a little bit of hope to them now. Now all they need is, of course, Devin Booker for that whole reunion trio to happen. There you go. So we'll see if that uh, ends up coming to fruition. Okay, uh, Skeets, let's switch gears now to the biggest surprise, in my opinion, of the season, the Toronto Raptors. You're a big Raptors fan as well. I mean, they lose Kawhi. They don't get anything in return for him. Right now, 37-14, second in the East. They're currently on a franchise-best 12-game winning streak. I got to get your reaction to the season. I mean, what are your thoughts of the Raptors to this point? I did not think it could get any better than last June when they beat the Warriors to win the championship. Um, you know, it was euphoric as a Raps fan for a long time. I was on cloud nine. But it maybe has gotten better. It really has because, like you said, they're doing all of this, of course, without Kawhi and even Danny Green, but they haven't been healthy also. Like, this is the big part. The Raptors have barely had a full squad here all season long. And yet they're second in the East. They're one of the best defensive teams in the league. Kyle Lowry has been dominant. He's obviously an all-star again. Pascal Siakam asked to do more, and he has, and delivered for the most part. You know, and then all these sort of hidden gems. Boucher, um, you know, Terrence Davis the second, Norman Powell Norman played Powell. the best ball he had ever played until he got injured. So, like, what Nick Nurse has done here, or what this Messiah and this sort of the, the culture, I guess, the organization have done is it's – Really, really impressive. Now, I still have reservations that this is going to work in the playoffs because as we saw, you need a Kawhi. You need yeah. a guy in a tight game, three minutes to go. It's it's a one-point game, and you need a bucket. Kawhi did it time and time again where he got to his spot, rose up, delivered. Now who is that for the Raptors in a playoff series? Like They're going to be in every game because their defense is unbelievable and they have a lot of talent. But who is going to be that guy? Is it Lowry? who at times before Kawhi was there struggled in that role? Or is it Pascal Siakam, who you're asking a lot as still a young guy yeah. um, growing to being a star, to being in a, to, to trying to be a superstar? So that's the interesting part to me. But all that said, I mean, this has been amazing to watch. These guys just reel off win after win after win here, despite not having their full team. If this is a full, healthy squad come playoff time, nobody's going to want to play them. That's for sure. Yeah. Like, no one would want anything to do with them. Because they have a chip on their shoulder because Kawhi's gone and everybody wrote them off. They're well coached. Nick Nurse is one of the most creative coaches in the league. And they're deep. And they have all these still talented guys that have now been there, done that, and are trying to say, yeah, Kawhi helped us win a title. But guess what? We also did the same for him. Um, So, you know, they obviously have that mojo going. So, uh, I mean, I'm not picking them to win the title again by any means, but they, they will be... They will be the most difficult out, I think, in the playoffs, be it in the second or third or maybe even for the final round. Yeah, no, I agree, and I don't, I don't want to downplay, obviously, the winning streak, but uh, to your point uh, about having that superstar player, I want to see them also being able to beat teams above 500 because they have yeah. been beating up on teams that they should be able to beat, so it'll be interesting yep. to see that matchup later on this month against the Bucks. I think that would be a true measuring stick to how they stack up going forward. 
Oh, 100%. And it would be nice if they had, you know, at, not even their full team, but most of their star guys. It, it's always, they've always had, it feels like, two of their really key rotation players always out of the lineup. Um, but when healthy, yeah, you're right. They have not racked up, you know, really impressive wins against the elite teams in the East or even some in the upper echelon in the West. But they take care of business against everybody else. And they're never out of a game. Yeah. I mean, they're just, they can be down 15. It does not matter. They believe... Uh, you know, Fred and Kyle and these guys and Serge, like, we get some stops, we can get back in this game. And uh, that defense can win you a lot of games. I mean, we just saw the Pacers game the other night. They had no right winning that game. And Oh, yeah. And, and the Pacers are like, a good team. Oh, the Pacers are a great team. They deserve to win that game. They hit 19 threes. You know, Oladipo was playing well. He's back. And Nick Nurse, what I love about him, he will switch it up. He is not afraid to be like, this is not working. Let's try this. A lot of coaches do not like to do that. They are stuck in their ways and let, al- you know, let alone within a game to switch it up, to like press, to go box one, as we saw obviously against the Warriors and stuff like that. They like to just, whatever works, works, and we just run with it. But Nurse is like, nope, let's try this. Let's throw this at the yeah. wall. Hey, maybe this will work. He'll do that in a game. He'll do that in a series. He'll do that you know, with, throughout the regular season. So yeah, he's always going to be like, I can't think of many coach matchups where if you're like doing like the check, you know, do you give guards to this team or forwards to this team or whatever? When you get to coaches, there ain't many where you're going to give the check to the uh, the opposition. It's going to go to Nurse because he's proven it in two years now. Yeah, I believe he's definitely a front runner when talking about coach of the year for this season. He has to be. So. He has to be. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, the Raptors' quiet deadline. We saw the Bucks do nothing. We saw the Sixers make a smaller move. And then we saw the Miami Heat getting a couple of key pieces bolstering their lineup. What are your thoughts on the Raptors' deadline or lack of a deadline? Did you want to see them go out and get a piece? Or are they okay how they are now? And I mean, given that they have won their last 12 games in a row, I mean, didn't it make sense to just stand put and not do anything? Yeah, I think it's two things, right? It's, it's one, the timing of it all. Uh, you're winning games. Yes, you're playing subpar competition for the most part, but you're still winning games. Um, so why rock the boat at all? And then the other part is, you know, they keep looking at their squad, you know, Bobby Webster and Masai going, we've got a great team. If they're all healthy, we might have one of the best teams in the league still. You know, they truly believe that, I think. Um, but we just haven't been there. So maybe our, our deadline, you know, pickup is just getting this break at the All-Star weekend and hopefully getting these guys all back to the second part of the season. Uh, when it really starts into the playoffs. So, yeah, it, I, I guess I wasn't surprised. They also do not have a ton of, like, tradable contracts. I mean, they're, they're, their star guys, you know, are, are on big deals. So it's going to take a lot of, like, you'd be blowing it up, so to speak, and moving a Lowry or a Gasol or an Ibaka. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and Siakam ain't going anywhere. So it's like there wasn't, like, even a lot of around the fringes, a lot of moves to be made just because of the contracts, I think, and what they saw out there on the market, which there really wasn't a ton either. So... Yeah, guess I'm not really that shocked that Raps, um, Bucks, you said, Celtics, Pacers, Lakers, uh, you know, the Jazz, you know, they had done Clarkson prior, but a lot of teams didn't really do a whole lot. Well, is there a, a name that you maybe wanted to see the Raptors go after? Because I, I know there was some rumors at the time, uh, them going after a Gallinari, but again, you would have to give up a, an Ibaka, and at that point, does yeah. it make sense? Probably not. Yeah, not the way Baca has been playing. I think exactly right. It's that type of stretch big um, that that can obviously you can put out there and, and just have another shooter. So a Gallinari makes sense. Um, you know, even in the Marcus Morris sort of chase, I know the Raptors really weren't tied to him all that much. But yeah, that's who you would have, I think, gone after. But again, you, I mean, Serge is that guy. That's I mean, he... They don't win a title without Serge playing the way he did from the conference finals on last year. And he... Serge can be hit or miss, there is no doubt. Um, when he's bad, he's really bad. Yeah. But when he's going, he's a difference maker. And we saw it last year, and I think we've seen it at times this year, even in the regular season. So not really a shock that they, you know, they like this squad. And that locker room seems to, like, just be, they, they just seem to gel perfectly, just the personalities. And Serge just to be, seems to be such a funny guy as it is. I think he might keep that locker room a little light as well. You saw the the whole scarf thing. I'm Big sure scarf energy in him. <laughs> yeah. And like, I think that, you know, look, the, what the value that you're giving on the court, that probably trumps all, but there is something to that as well. Right. That type of personality in the locker room, keeping the lot, the, the mood light and just being a funny guy and you want him around. And, and he, and again, he's, he's proven that he can contribute too. So not a big shock. They didn't do anything. 
Okay, so you don't have the Raptors repeating as champions, but do you no, have them not. coming out of the East? I, it is tough to watch the Milwaukee Bucks right now and think of a team beating them in the Eastern Conference at least four times out of seven. So I, I, I probably lean towards Milwaukee. I am a Raptors fan, so it always hurts to say this, but I'm a realist as well. I would take right now, and even this is if the Raptors were fully, fully healthy, the Bucks. The way Giannis is leading that team, he is why. I mean, that guy's just locked in right now. Like it, it is, it's finals or bust for him. I agree. Um, it might be championship or bust for him, but it's at least finals or bust for that squad. So I can't pick against them. They're just humming along right now. The only thing that's going to be their Achilles heel in a playoff series is the Bucks. I'm speaking of is if a team gets caught, if a team catches fire from three, because they give up a, a bunch of threes, they say. We're going we're gonna to give you nothing at the rim. Easy. We got Brooke. We got Giannis. We swarm our defense. Bledsoe will you know, dig down inside. But we'll give you threes. You're going to get looks. But we don't think you can make as many as we can on the other end. And it will be, you know, it'll be like, remember, I remember the Raptors playing the Cavs a couple of years ago when LeBron, of course, was still there. And there was that one particular year where the, just, the Cavs just couldn't miss threes in a series. And, like, Dwayne Casey was left going, like, that's the game plan. That's what we have to do against them. Like we can't have them parading to the free throw line or LeBron dunking on us. We got to pack the paint. And unfortunately, you know, they, they, that was the year that they just decided they couldn't miss threes in a playoff series. That really did the Raptors in, I remember. So that's going to be the only thing that I think can sort of knock down the Bucks in the East is one of these teams. Maybe it's the Raps, you know, maybe it's the Celtics. The Sixers obviously give them some trouble at times with their size, just being able to catch fire um, from three, but I got to take Milwaukee. I think, I, I just I can't the way Giannis is playing right now it's just he's everybody's here and then he's just up a little bit more um, just that locked in so I'll go with them. No, that that's fair to say, but I am gonna say I am a little bit surprised, if you will, that the Bucks didn't make even a small move at the deadline. We saw them get Miritich last yeah. deadline, which I thought was big. I I yeah. just think they need a little bit more something. Now I'm not saying they should have gone out and get another All Star caliber player, but even somebody to come yeah. off the bench. So I was shocked in that sense that they didn't make another deadline day uh, move like they did last year. That's fair, but I think they're just, they're impressed with how guys like, when you get past the stars, the all-stars, whatever you want to call them, I'll even throw Bledsoe in the mix. Like, they're impressed with how Pat Connaughton has played, and DiVincenzo has played, and Corver has even played. And I think they're pretty excited with these guys, and I really do think, also, let come on. They are a set, they're on pace to win 70 games. Yeah, it's 70 crazy. 70 games right now. We're barely talking about it. And, I mean, if you're on that pace, then something's going right. I mean, you as a GM, you must go, I don't know. Do we mess with what? Do we mess with this chemistry where these guys pretend wrestle each other in the back before every game? <laughs> I love that. And, you know, Rob, and Robin's into it. And Wes Matthews is into it. Like, everybody's, like, feeling good. Like, I think you just sort of I, – I hear you. You can always try and improve around the margins, but maybe not. Maybe you just, like – Everybody gets along in here. Let's let's just keep riding this. Let's see how far we can go. And then on the other side, who do you got coming out of the West? I mean, is it ultimately either the Clippers or Lakers? Yeah, that's the answer. I don't see. I can't convince myself that the Jazz or the Nuggets or even the Rockets with this small ball experiment, as much as I like it, um, them going with guys all you know six seven six six and under it's fun it's cool it's unique i don't know if that'll work in a playoff series they beat the lakers <laughs> yeah i know I, I mean i like that they're going all into it i think yeah uh, you know i put i was talking to somebody else about this uh, not too long ago like this idea like they weren't going to win a title with capella i mean so no. you might as well like just like again lean all into the idea of you know who our center is oddly on this team it's westbrook because he can't shoot <laughs> so let's just surround Westbrook with a bunch of shooters. Pretty and much. Let Westbrook attack. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it all falls apart if P.J. Tucker gets injured. That is the one thing. Like, if that guy takes an elbow to the head and gets a concussion and is up for a couple bit, it's over. It will fall apart. But anyway, I think the Lakers or the Clippers are – hopefully they meet in, a, in a, obviously, a staple center series. That would be epic. Uh, it'd be epic. And I, I think I think I lean towards still taking the Clippers. Um and it really it it mainly is because of Kawhi. I haven't seen anything from Kawhi when he plays this year where I'm like, oh, he's lost a step or something like that. I'm like, all what I every time I watch him, I'm like, oh yeah, that's what you did 
in the playoff series with the Raptors. Yeah, we saw firsthand, again. right? So he's a he's a machine, man. So and then with that team, I mean, it's obviously a deep team. They got like two rosters on that team. So LeBron is LeBron and AD is AD. But uh, I think I still go Clippers. You um, know, obviously a, a a tight series if they met, if they meet up. Hopefully they do meet up. Yeah, I agree with you on that one. Okay, Skeets, we're going to switch gears now. One final segment I want to do with you. Very lighthearted sure. here, but I'm going to do some yeah. rapid fire. So uh, okay. you ready for this? All right. Let's Let's uh, let's begin here. All right, first rapid fire question. Team Giannis or Team LeBron? To win the All-Star game, it's Team LeBron by a mile. Yeah. I mean, he, <laughs> like Giannis might be the best player in the game right now, but uh, GM LeBron is a better GM than Giannis. I think uh, we learned that once again. LeBron's team is stacked. Like, it's stacked. It is. Yeah. Yeah, so, it, yeah, Le- LeBron. Uh, who's better at basketball, you or Taz? Ooh, uh, I, I think I am. I hope Taz won't get upset with me. I, uh, I probably, I probably played a lot longer than Taz did as well. Taz is a better baseball player. There's no doubt about that. Um, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a decent ball player. I can still hang despite nearing 40. I still got speed. I'm a playmaker. I play hard on defense. My shot mm, comes and goes. I'm a bit streaky that way, but, uh, I'm still taking me over Taz, I guess, on the playground. I like it. Next one. Who would you play? Uh, against in the game of 21 any current nba player who would it be wow oh that's a good question ah huh i guess i'm gonna go a current player yeah or you know what we'll, we'll extend it current or past whatever okay, I'll, probably go, I'll, I'll probably go steve nash if we can go uh you know former players it's one of my favorite players of all time um and i've had a chance to interview him a couple of times he's an awesome guy Obviously, he's one of the best players of all time in terms of the point guard position. Canadian. Uh, I'll go Nash. If I went current, huh. I think I would go... I'd probably go Kyle Lowry. Let's be honest. I'll, I mean, I would want to thank him. So I would, uh, <laughs> you know... I would play it. I'd, I'd go Lowry if yeah. it was current, but I'll go Nash. I'll That'd play. be a cool game of one-on-one. Side note, though, you are a Nash lookalike, I must say. You probably get that a lot. Yeah, I've gotten that before. We've uh, Actually, uh, there's a quick funny story about that. Um... When I was at an, I think it was an all-star weekend. Don't quote me on that. But I was, I believe it was in Toronto. I was walking in like sort of the bowels of the stadium. And I was in like, uh, I forget what part it was, but it was sort of a small, narrow ha- uh, hallway. And I, walking down it and coming the other way is Nash. <laughs> and there's no one else in the hallway. And we're coming obviously at each other. And as we get closer, I mean, I saw him, I think, before he saw me. And then he saw me coming. And I think he sort of recognized me because, again, we had talked before a couple of times. And then we got sort of, sort of as we got closer and closer, I think I said something like, oh, it's like looking in a mirror. And he had a good joke <laughs> about it. We, like, sort of pretended that we were doing, like, a, like a little mirror bit. Um, but, uh, yes, I've gotten that before. Which but- I guess is a, you know what, I'll take it as a compliment. I mean, look, I, sure, I'm a national play. Yeah, why not? Uh, next why not? question. Next question I got for you here. You might have already answered this, but uh, favorite interview you've ever done in your career? Mm, well, that's a good question. Uh, Nash was great, but that was a long, long time ago. That's when I was like freaking out interviewing him because that's back in the score days. Uh, maybe when we were with the starters and we had a chance to have a lot of guests on. Who was my favorite? I mean, the most memorable, it's not an interview by any means, but it's Shaq giving me a wedgie. That was great. Uh, uh, live on air. That will be... That will be my most memorable on-air moment. That's Big one of my Shaq favorite moments like, of you, by the way. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. I mean, Shaq, a giant man, literally gave me an atomic wedgie. That was great. My underwear off. Um, uh, but my favorite, that's a, honestly a great question. Like, Vince has been great to talk to. He's a hes a fun interview and is always a good sport. I, like, there hasn't been many bad ones, I got to say. When we would go to Vegas Summer League and do all the interviews with some of the young kids, um, I really liked Devin Booker. I thought he was great. De'Aaron Fox was great. Um, man, I can't really pick one uh, that that sticks out the most though. Matumbo was awesome. Matumbo, we did him. We interviewed him on air, and he was hilarious, obviously, because he's Matumbo. And then he stuck around after the show for like another thirty minutes. That's great. And we wow. just like you know, t- and he was like, we were asking him just stories about his playing days. Um, so he was pretty cool too, and uh, he was just, I wasn't expecting it, I guess, with him, that he'd be like that. He was just so chill and laid back and had all these great stories and, you know, didn't, was sort of unfiltered in telling the stories. Next one, your favorite basketball Jones parody that you've ever made? 
uh, probably like a Bosch was the, was the big one that, I don't know, maybe one of our most famous ones. I, you know, I, ones I really did enjoy though, what, um, we would do, and I, and it's funny cause I, we were doing this like 15 years ago and I've seen people do it over the last five years or so where you like take a clip and then you insert the audio over yeah. it, like what they would be saying. And we had some pretty funny ones. Uh, there was a Kobe Ron Artest moment where they got into it, where we, you know, dubbed over it. Um, oh, okay. I will say my answer though. I don't know if it's a parody or whatever, but we did like a music video showing love to all the teams in the NBA. Um, I remember that Matt, one. Yeah, that yeah, was a great so one. Matty O and I wrote the lyrics like in one night. I remember at some bar, like we, we wrote the lyrics and he did all the music with JD and then Tass and I performed it. And I, I love that one. I actually think that like the lines are really funny in it. And JD knocked it out of the park because we're like sort of a cheesy boy band <laughs> sort of vibe to it. Um, I'll probably go that one. That one was really fun to make too. Great inter- entertainment, that's for sure. And then finally, um, pineapples on pizza, yay or nay? Oh, big time yay. Yeah? Huge. Oh, thumbs up. You yeah, said that I without hesitation. It. I thought I was going to get oh. some. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> no, 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 no. I love uh, a little sweetness to my food. A little sweet and spicy if you can get that going at the same time. So... I'm, uh, my wife and I disagree on that. We have to do the, like, you know, at some places where you can do, like, I'll take half with these uh, toppings and I'll take half of the pizza with these toppings. We are those people that do that because she doesn't like pineapple um, on a pizza, and I do. I like barbecue sauce on a pizza, so that just goes to show you oh, how wow. sweet up. Yeah. <laughs> You're I interesting. Know. That's interesting. I, I got to agree with your wife with her preferences. I don't know about yours, though. <laughs> She's not a fan of that. She's not a fan of that, so. <laughs> Thumbs up on, on pineapple on a pizza. Anyway, Skeets, that was a blast. Thank you so much for doing this, guys. You can follow the uh, No Dunks podcast. All the links will be in the description box down below. This was cool to do. Like I said, I grew up watching you. I still do listen and watch your stuff. So uh, double thumbs up. Thank you so much for doing this, and I hope we can definitely do it again sometime soon. No problem, Luca. I, I, I love the setup you got going on here, man. Right, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Take care. <laughs>